Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 5 of Energy vs. Climate. My name is Ed Whittingham, and as always, I'm joined by my webinar co-hosts, Sarah Hastings simon and David Keith. Well, the annual United Nations Climate Change Conference, otherwise known as the Conference of the Parties 27, or COP27, has officially wrapped up after running from November 6th to 20th. Expectations for COP27 were pretty meh. We didn't expect ambitious national plans to emerge, and they didn't. EU ambition seemed to be hamstrung by its need to secure short-term energy sources for this winter and next. And of course, we had the usual bunch of prickly issues that were present, and those are limited country-level progress on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the role of fossil fuels going forward, and the ongoing failure to bridge a climate finance divide between developed and developing countries. And then, seemingly suddenly, we got a last-minute breakthrough on a face-saving framework for something called a loss and damage fund. So, in the end, did COP27 merely live up to its low expectations, or did it over-deliver? Why were those expectations so low going in? And were they exceeded in the end? What went well? What didn't go well? And as always, what are the implications for Canada? So today on EVC, we're doing a post-COP27 debrief with two people who are there in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. One is our own intrepid co-host, David Keith, and the other is today's guest, Adrien Abikassis. Adrien is a career diplomat, a former senior advisor to the French president, and currently the chief policy officer of the Paris Peace Forum. He's also principal and special advisor to the co-chair of a new body called the Global Commission on Governing Risks from Climate Overshoot, also known as the Climate Overshoot Commission. So today we'll also learn about that initiative and, and how it figured into COP. Adrien has worked for 15 years in international policy, science and technology, and global governance. He was an Emmett Fellow in Environmental Law and Policy at UCLA and an International Affairs Fellow at Harvard University, where he first met David. And today he's joining us from Paris after returning from Egypt. Welcome, Adrien. Thank you. I'm happy to be there. So let's start with the venue itself and, and COP meetings generally. Sharm El Sheikh, it's, it's a tourist hotspot right on the Red Sea. It's known for its great diving. But uh, David and Adrien, tell us, uh, how was it as a COP venue? Well, it's a tourist venue, but it's a tourist venue with predominantly very rich hotels, you know, designed as a way to suck money out of mostly international tourists. And because the thing is in the, the Sinai, where there's a bit of an insurgency now, and there was a, a big attack there uh, a decade or so ago, it's actually kind of surrounded by a wall. So it very much feels like not the real Egypt. It was a completely different experience from Cairo. And maybe in that sense, it's kind of fitting for a cop. Um, I agree. I may... Um Add to your question that COP has became a strange beast uh, this last uh, year. Now, wh what's a COP? There, there, there's two uh, possible answers to that. One is a, a COP is just the gathering of the party of the uh, UNFCCC conference, so it's a diplomatic meeting. But the reality is that it's uh, much, much more than that, uh, and it's becoming much more than that uh, each year. And I think that has to do with uh, Paris, with the COP21 in Paris, with the Paris Agreement and the kind of conceptual difference between the Paris Agreement and, and, and Kyoto. They, there were, I think, 4,000 people in this meeting, which was way, way more than any diplomatic meeting that you can have. And the diplomatic part uh, at the COP, where uh, the representative of the uh, states negotiate, are actually a small part of what's happening um, on the ground. The rest is a lot of... Uh, activities, um, lots of uh, different uh, actors from uh, NGO to companies to uh, um, a different that, that organize their meeting, that approve their own uh, agenda and so on. Um, and uh, there is different way of seeing that. One is that it, it's a distraction from what should happen, which is a commitment from state to reduce the, uh, their, their emission. Uh, my, my view is that uh, it's a kind of necessary feature of a climate action now. Uh, and the, the, the climate transition is not just an issue that can be settled between discussion, uh, uh, among discussion between uh, uh, states. It involves very broad transformation, transformation of uh, production models, uh, perhaps tr transforming society, as some uh, NGO uh, yeah. uh, argues for, uh, and that involves all the actors. And what happened in Paris was the uh, realization that to mobilize them, their 
expectation must be stabilized. And so they, ha they have to be convinced that something is going to happen, that emissions will be cut, uh, and so that they will have to adapt their own, uh, their own plan, their own vision for the future for their organization, their business model, etc., Uh, to, to this new reality. But to do that, you have to have a kind of multi-stakeholder approach in each negotiation. And th that create this kind of, uh, the, the, the FT called uh, this uh, COP a jamboree, which uh, I think they are right on, uh, on that. Uh, so yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, boy scoutish uh, thing and, uh, and, and so on. But, but it has become a, an essential feature, this uh, multi-stakeholder approach. So it's more than a diplomatic conference. Uh, and and that, that also explain why when it happens it's always a little bit outside of its environment you know uh, and so Sharm uh, el was a, um, a good venue uh, for that I think it, it would have been very very hard to organize such a thing in Cairo for instance it, I mean it's easy to to laugh at this sort of ridiculous collection of everything from like people essentially selling proposals for low emission vehicles to uh, everybody from NASA agencies to national governments to uh, various industries of different kinds to all sorts of NGOs all kind of hawking their wares with, you know, um, uh, 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 venues like in a big conference where people are selling things. But, uh, you know, to step back, I think the academic perspective, the big perspective, um, is that as, as my colleague Joe Nye at the Kennedy School has put it, power has diffused away from states over the last decades. That's a general fact of international affairs. So, Power is, if you think about it as a kind of fluid with a fixed quantity, power has moved towards uh, transnational businesses and transnational NGOs and civil society groups in complicated ways. But there's a distinct sense in which states have less kind of power to control affairs than they did, you know, half a century ago. And and for climate, I think the, the fancy word is that this is polycentric governance, that climate is not about just what some states happen to agree with each other. Uh, climate is it, it's a situation where no one is in charge, where there is uh, power in the, the big fossil fuel industry. We'll talk about that in a minute. Power in the, the big NGOs, power in, in other civil society organizations, labor unions, and so on, and power in states in this complicated way where nobody's the boss. And so the way I see it is, at least right now, where there's nothing big happening in negotiations, I see the frankly, the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is formerly the thing that's negotiating is actually kind of it, it, nearly irrelevant in this cycle, but it's an excuse to bring together these different parties who are, in fact, doing whatever is done or helping to control whatever is done about climate policy. It's an interesting point, David, because so often COP uh, meetings and the results that come out of them underwhelm. And yet still, you could say that the, the globe is making progress. We're no longer, you, know, you could say 20 years ago, we we're solidly on a trajectory to a higher level of warming than the trajectory we're on now, you know, with four to five degrees. And now it seems that we're on something that would be closer to two to three degrees. Actually, I want to talk about letting go or not letting go of 1.5 C. But just quickly, my COP experience, I was at COP 16 at Cancun. So David, to your point, it was kind of like there is a wall, you know, in this tourist spot between where we were and, and the rest of Mexico. And then I was at COP 21, Adrien, uh, in Paris. And that really felt historic. And I must say it had a very different tone because it was just a few weeks after the Bataclan massacre. And I was actually staying in the 11th uh, arrondissement, uh, very close to the Bataclan itself, as, as close to uh, the Republic uh, Metro. And it just had much more of a somber feel, but perhaps that somber feel really focused attention. And maybe that was one small contributing factor to, to the, the historic result that came out of COP21. Sarah, I know to, you, you, yeah, go ahead, David. Just to interrupt very quickly on progress. So projections of what temperature we're aiming for, we don't really have the ability to make those projections in a very meaningful way, but we can say what's happening now. And one big thing that's happening now is the flow of money into clean energy is now about $750 billion a year, 0.75% of global GDP. And that's up by about a factor of three in a decade. So that's true. And there's also real reason to believe that emissions are pretty darn close to their peak, uh, that the pace of emissions growth is really slowed, that you're seeing in many of the big economies in the world, in Europe and, and, and North America, that, that economic growth is proceeding, but emissions are declining. So that feels like a, a fundamental turning point in the climate world compared to a decade or two ago. Correct. Well said. Sarah, you've been I mean, part of the... Just... Uh, 
Go ahead, Adrian. No, sorry. If I can pile up on uh, what David said, because I think it's a, a, a crucial point, and I think I might have a minority view here in the climate debate, but uh, perhaps in, with insight, we, re we realize that uh, we are making much progress than we uh, often think. Uh, so yes, of course, the uh, projection are very hard, and there's a lot of uncertainty on the uh, range of uh, uh, temperature, but. Uh, all the reports that were uh, released just before the COP, the uh, UNEP uh, GAP report, the um, uh, AIE uh, report, and so on, they uh, converge uh, into, you know, they, they have kind of three main figures. Uh, the uh, current policies, uh, uh, which uh, mean that uh, legislation of all states of the world are frozen as they are today, and no new climate action is taken until uh, 2100, something like that. Uh, would bring the world to 2.8. Uh, so it, it, it's not the most credible scenario. Why would uh, climate action uh, come to a halt today? Um, implementing the commitment made by 2030, that is the NDCs, uh, and then after uh, nothing else happened, uh, would bring the world to 2.5, to 2.4, 2.4, 2.6, depending on... Uh, uh, that's also kind of unlikely. Why would everything stop in, in, in 2030? And implementing the commitment made by 2015 which is, uh, and beyond, which is the net, net zero pledges and, uh, that has been made, that are not detailed, right? But, uh, uh, then that would uh, may bring the world toward 1.8 or something like that. And you remember that the, the, the Paris Agreement goals, actually, uh, it's well below two degree uh, and uh, uh, best efforts to 1.5. Uh -huh. I think we don't say enough that the Paris Agreement are an extraordinary international achievement. I mean, the uh, the target of well below two degree is not out of reach. Yeah. And uh, if, if we take a step back, this is perhaps uh, the first time in, in, in human history that public policies all around the world have been redirected in such a short time, in five years, six years, in a relatively coordinated way to achieve uh, goals that we set collectively. Uh, and the, this is not a small thing, I think. Uh, so, of course, there's a lot of uh, ifs, uncertainty, condition, the implementation of all these uh, commitments remain a, a huge challenge for decades to come. That's logical. There are plans for... Uh, 30 and 40 years, you wouldn't expect a high level of details of uh, what you will do for the next uh, 30 years. Um, the uh, international mechanism for uh, monitoring accountability uh, and some of the commitment are not there. This is a major challenge for the years to come. But I think that without being unreasonable, we can uh, uh, be a bit more optimistic uh, on, on the political message on climate than uh, than. than, than most of the uh, messages are now. Well, Adria, I will agree that the policy pivot that we've seen around climate has been impressive. The policy pivots that we saw around a global respiratory illness pandemic and a war really show what the world will do if it wants to take something seriously. But clearly we are. It's just, it didn't move. It's not moving at that speed that we saw with, with say, COVID and the war in Ukraine. Sarah, you've been part of helping to prep, like the, there's a whole industry around the lead up to COPS and producing research and convening that then has that kind of influence that David talked about, which is uh, outside, but arguably now as important as the influence that countries have. Do you, do you want to talk about your experience? Sure. And and I actually, quite a number of years ago now, was involved with a um, a part of the UNFCCC process that sits align alongside COP. So this was particularly um, discussions uh, between countries around the $100 billion fund um, that was described at the time as uh, the money that you know developed countries would be providing to developing countries to help them um, uh, you know transition and, and adjust. Um, that obviously was sort of a later version of that was a big part, uh, topic of conversation at, at COP this year. But because that was not directly in a COP, um, it didn't have, you know, all the other bits around it um, that uh, that Adrian and David were talking about around, you know, civil society and other people that were there. It was really just a discussion amongst the, the countries um, themselves focused on this technical question, really, of, you know, how do you do that? How could you what what could different mechanisms for raising that money be? Um, 
And there's a few things that, you know, really stood out to me from that. Um, and, and it, you know, I didn't end up doing a lot of work within that um, uh, UNFCCC uh, environment afterwards, um, which maybe says more about, you know, my own, <laughs> my own work and working style than, than uh, whether or not that's effective. But, um, you know, I think the, the two big things that I took from it, one is that at its heart, there is a lot of, you know, at its core, a lot of the discussions within the, the UNFCCC process is really about fairness, right? And, and fairness in a way that it's hard to come up with a clear right answer for that. It's a little bit subjective. Um, you know, I, it's maybe some listeners know I have twins and, and I think a lot about, you know, fairness and what do you do when there's two people, uh, you know, you're, th there's always things that come up, right. As a parent of any parent of, of multiple children, I think has, has this, um, and you often find situations where there, you know, there really isn't a, a clear right answer. Right. And I think that is in some sense, some of the challenge of, of cop. And even if, you know, maybe one could say a totally, neutral observer might say that, you know, clearly it's fair uh, that uh, countries that have, you know, emitted a lot of carbon in the past are, are going to be paying for, um, you know, damages that that has, that's, has caused. But the challenge uh, with, uh, with COP, and that sort of leads to the other piece within the process, is that there is no, you know, there is no judge, there is no, uh, you know, ultimate decider. At its core, it's really a negotiation um, between com uh, countries. And although we know that, um, you know, all countries are going to bear the, the negative effects of, of climate change, um, it's not, you know, I think historically it hasn't been obviously as front and center as some of the other topics that you just brought up, Ed, in terms of, you know, war and a, and a virus um, that act on this very short term. And so, you know, I think that when I, when I try to wrap my head around, you know, is there, what does is, what is COP deliver? What does it not deliver? You know, I think it's historically and, and what we see um, maybe in this year is that there's a lot more really around kind of coordination in the process versus compelling any countries to actually do something that they, you know, don't want to do, right? And I think if if we try to expect that the latter is going to happen, that countries are going to be forced into action that they weren't going to take, and that, you know, is going to be this great hammer of this negotiation process, you know, that's always going to fail because, you know, as, as I guess as also maybe parents know, um, you know, you, there are certain things that you simply can't force your, your children to do. Do, and, and the same is true within negotiations between uh, between countries. That said, I don't think that it means that it's unimportant because that global coordination role and really having a place where um, you know you can be clear about everything that's happening, that countries can be influenced by each other, uh, each other's action, and a race towards you know not wanting to be left behind. There's a lot of ways uh, in which that can you know lead to better outcomes than if you didn't have this mechanism at all. Um, I, I think we'll probably come back to talk about it more, but I think that you know certainly, I think it's fair to say that that historically the process has failed as far as you know raising those funds that were supposed to flow to countries um, for climate finance and you know while there was a big success in setting up the agreement to have a damages fund uh, you know in some sense having the fund is almost the easier part and actually getting people to put money into the fund um, is is quite a bit harder I would say and so you know yes it's it's a success that it was created. But I think that's probably one of the, you know, the the hardest things that would have to come out of a process like this. And and I maybe that's the one where I'm a bit more pessimistic around um, future progress there. Although, you know, the the logic behind it and the the when you look at sort of it's very easy to see where these emissions have come from and who created them and, you know, where the damage arises as a result. Yeah, and that's the uh, the perennial irritant in creating these funds. It's you can create the fund, but then countries are actually delivering on their funding pledges. Uh, that's another issue, and that includes the loss and damage fund. It's still unclear who's actually going to inject the money. But on that note, let's so let's bring it back specifically to COP twenty seven and David and Adrian. Your take. You were there. You're recently back. Beyond the loss and damage fund, what went well? what didn't go well, and, and even if you can, like why were expectations low going in relative to the moderate success that came out of uh, Glasgow last year? So the, the um, first thing, I, I won't downplay what means the agreement on the loss and damage fund. Uh, 
it, it, it's it's more than a face saving exercise at the end of the uh, negotiation to uh, have something to 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 deliver. You know, remember uh, last year in Glasgow, uh, it was decided on on this uh, question to launch a dialogue process that would last for two and a, two and a half years, something like that until June 2024, I think, uh, before any decision was taken. And one year later, we have a phone. Um, uh, so there has been a huge acceleration of the process. I, I, I think that the, de the decision, the agreement on creating the phone um, mm. is uh, perhaps came a bit out of surprise. I'm not sure that all the delegation were uh, convinced at the beginning of the COP that this would have been an achievable result. Um, and and this is something that will uh, last in this COP. You know, the, uh, the uh, COP27 at Sharm El Sheikh will be the COP that created this phenomenon. Um, uh, and not all COP have something to deliver that creates something new that lasts uh, more than. Uh, yeah. um, so I, I, I won't um, uh, don't play it. I think it's even better when you think about the geopolitical time we are in. No. Uh, and it was easy to predict some kind of breakdown of dialogue or collapse of negotiation uh, amidst uh, high geopolitical tension, divisions. Uh, you know, the the, uh, the 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 COVID pandemic plus the uh, energy crisis plus the debt crisis that is rising has created much more than uh, tension at a level that hasn't been seen for decades in the international system, including north-south tension, um, and uh, they was a risk that uh, uh, this reverberates in the climate talk and prevents any kind of dialogue. And we saw the opposite, actually. Uh, we saw that there were a political will to not being dragged down by this uh, multiplication of crises, but to uh, still show that cooperation, you were talking about a coordination cooperation, as well, um, that, that, that uh, this is something that is still going on uh, now, despite all what's happening uh, uh, in, uh, in geopolitics. And I, I think that that's also something that we should uh, we should uh, keep in mind um, on the element of uh, so there there has been no uh, progress on the mitigation uh, that's true uh, but there's also a bit of symbolism here uh, of course we we would have liked stronger language on the emission reduction but uh, the, the the main question is, is is no longer a question of a putting stronger language in a, a commonly agreed declaration we could have something like yeah we will have phased down a, a fossil fuel and so uh, we we are beyond that now that, that that was the question of a couple of years ago now we have this instrument we have the ndc we have a lot of commitments uh, and if you want to uh, tighten the commitment it's not in this declaration it's in it, it's in these instruments uh, so the uh, you would measure uh, the uh, the level of ambition uh, not on the wording but on what are there additional indices what do they say when you pile them uh, uh, what's happening um, uh, and and what the implementation process so we are not still on on a very good track on that we are on the track but uh, there's no implementation there's no accountability mechanism there, there, there's a lot of things missing there. Um, but I think that the focus should not be on what are the words negotiating in the uh, general declaration uh, um, on mitigation. I think we are beyond that now. David, can I turn to you? I'd love to get your take as well. Sure. Two comments. First on loss and damage. I agree that setting up this fund may prove to be a big thing because it admits more directly the the liability for loss and damage. And maybe it's important to say this is happening at the same time as there's been not this year, but over a decade, a dramatic improvement from applied economists in our ability to predict what the economic damages are from climate. And we find that while lots of the talk is still about uh, heat waves and, or, or floods and, and extreme weather, the, the biggest impacts really seem to be related to temperature, and we're better and better able to quantify what they are. They both kill people, but they also make people less productive at work, which slows economic growth. Those two things together uh, have really big economic consequences. That is big meaning in the hottest countries, say in, in Africa, like in Egypt, where the population is at roughly 100 million now and will grow to 200 million uh, as the population pyramid fills out. The, the impacts are you know, of order tens of percent of GDP uh, uh, late in the century, really, really big reductions in, in, in Egypt's growth, and in some places bigger. And so- you know, if if justice says that those who cause the problem should pay the people who suffer, the actual amount of payments should be 
many percent of global GDP, so kind of trillion dollar payments, not hundred million dollar payments, which in fact aren't being paid anyway. So I think the beginning of admitting that there's a liability there is a big deal. But of course, the other thing at this COP is that lots of the environmental community wanted a explicit a commitment to phase out fossil fuels. And in some ways, objectively, or sort of technocratically, you'd say this is a kind of a non-issue because if you're agreeing to cut emissions, it's sort of your business whether, I mean, cutting emissions more or less means cutting out fossil fuels, except some fossil fuels in a residual will get used for, you know, making cement where you put the CO2 you've captured back down a hole. But but fundamentally, what one ought to care about in climate is just eliminating emissions, uh, and it should be countries' business how to do it. But practically, and I get it, the reason the NGO community is focused on this is they realize, I think correctly, that of course, we're not really on pace to cut emissions the way we've said, and that explicit decisions uh, or proclamations about phasing out fossil might help politically in accelerating the energy transition we need. And I just want to come back to one point that you mentioned, David, and that's the admission of liability. So the loss and damage fund, I see it as yet, you know, the latest and greatest step toward overall recognizing that there will be damages and the place where a lot of the damages will happen, equatorial states, mid-latitude states, they shouldn't be the ones who'd be held responsible. But the U.S. and even its, its rock star special envoy on climate, John Kerry, were clear in agreeing to set up this fund is that they wanted that liability to be severed. It was almost a fact, you know, sure, we want the fund, but we want you all to sign this waiver saying that we're not actually going to be held directly responsible for your losses. Is is that important? Do we need to to break down that kind of resistance? Because if you look, who's most responsible for historic emissions up there? You know, there's still like the the Walmart blob. It's it's the United States and now being followed closely uh, by China. But back to you, is, is that important or not? My personal view is these details of what people are now saying about liability don't matter much. That a big picture, this is kind of in the legalese, the big picture is that the world is inching towards an agreement that something is owed from the high admitters uh, uh, to, to those who will suffer. Okay. I'd like to now pivot the conversation to talk about fossil fuels. And uh, I want to do that because uh, this is one of the parts of COP27 in, in Sharm el-Sheikh that seemed to disappoint a lot of outside observers. Uh, it seemed that, that the place, even more than COPs I'd been to or Glasgow, it was frankly flooded with oil and gas lobbyists. And as a result, we really didn't, it, it really felt like oil producing states secured a COP win by blocking language to phase out fossil fuels beyond what came out of Glasgow, which is that commitment to phase out coal. And and I know the Saudis are part of it, and maybe this is their win and that buoyed them into last yesterday's World Cup win against Argentina. They took the momentum out of Charm and they brought a Qatar and they beat the Argentinians. But Sarah, what's your take on this? And can, can we get the progress back? Or again, does it really matter at this point? So, yeah, I've, I've been thinking a little bit more about what that means, that there are so many fossil fuel uh, participants. Um, and I think one way to interpret it is actually as a sign of progress, right? And so, I mean, I'll put forward a, a theory and, and people can shoot it down and say it's totally wrong. But I mean, one way to interpret it is that, you know, things are finally starting to happen, right? And we talked to uh, on the on the last uh, episode of Energy versus Climate, we talked um, with the IEA uh, chief energy economist, uh, who was saying, you know, this is the first time in history that uh, we're going to have a decline in demand for for fossil fuel. And so there is a, a world in which I think you can interpret this as like this is starting to matter, and these fossil fueling producing states and and organizations are starting to say, hey, this is actually, you know, we need to care about this now because this is actually a serious threat to our business in a way that it never was before. Because, you know, previously we talked about emissions reductions, but always in the backdrop of a world that was going to be using increasingly more hydrocarbons. And, you know, while we may not be at the point of discussing a fossil fuel phase out, um, you know, as we talked about previously, this idea that there, there are going to be big structural changes to the market if all of a sudden, you know, demand stops growing and starts shrinking. So, 
So I think that there, yeah, I, I guess that to me is sort of one way to maybe understand why there was an effort made for organ for companies and states uh, to show up in that way that they never had before. Um, you know, where that leads you next and, and kind of what you do about that, you know, is it is it about trying to then say, well, in the future, we need to have fewer people there um, because they're actually able to block that progress. I'm a little bit... I don't know. I, I guess I'm I'm going to be the one who's suspicious of everything today. I think I'm I'm a little suspicious about you know the idea that it was really the participants of the um, of the fossil fuel companies that that you know blocked that language. I think ultimately that comes from the states, uh, you know, the nation states. Of course, they are influenced by uh, the the companies and the fossil fuel interests in their states. But whether or not they are um, at COP, I think has less of an impact than just. You know they're always going to have power over them, and and you know whether it's the loss or damage fund or or fossil fuels, um, you know cu countries that are there always have to come back home and answer to their constituents for what they've done and what they've promised and what they said while they were at COP. So I think that is somehow you know whether or not people are actually physically there or not, um, maybe may be questionable. I mean I do think, and and we've talked about that previously that. Certainly within that, within the non-negotiative process and this like other space where people are, you know, working to make progress, it's important that um, we don't have, you know, kind of fantastical claims of how we're going to, you know, continue to use just as much fossil fuel or more and decarbonize it all. And that's going to be the answer, right? If that starts to become a, a dominant narrative, I think that, of course, is is problematic, Um and and maybe David and and Adrian can speak to whether or not you know the <laughs> people were sort of buying that message or not. But but I think on the negotiation side, and and on the COP as a whole, I'd be tempted to say you know really the climate community should take this as a win and a sign that you know they should keep doing what they're doing. Uh, I I agree with you because I have the same opinion. So you must be right. But no, I I had the same thought, which is this is the end of the phony war. Uh, when the fossil fuel uh, industry and nations start to send a lot of delegates, that's when they're starting to notice that this is not just talk and something's real. And so I take that as a sign of victory. And I think, you know, that, that it, and, and remember, it'll be a long, long time until fossil fuels are really faded out. But, but once global production begins to decline, that really changes who wins and loses in the fossil game and really begins to change geopolitics in ways that matter. Yes, and we need to talk about those chickens coming home to roost here in Canada. And I'd love to get a, a sense of how Canada showed up at this meeting. But Adrian, I'd love to get the EU perspective because I'd mention off the top, you know, e the EU right now is kind of in between this rock and a hard place when it comes to uh, keeping people warm. It's, you know, we, we learned, and as Sarah mentioned, when we had Tim Gould from the IEA on last show, you know, they've secured what the EU has secured the, the gas reserves it needs, you know, it's hopefully a mild winter. It's going to get through. Next winter remains a, a bit of a question mark. But the EU is normally leading the charge on things that are fossil related and, and leading the charge on fossil fuel phase out. But it's in this difficult position in the short term when it needs to go and has done uh, and has gone and hoovered up fossil assets just to keep lights on and to keep people warm. You know, Qatar is having this great, you know, third of a trillion dollar party in part because they've sold a lot of gas to the EU over the last few months. So maybe give us your commentary on how the EU, its perspective at this particular time, at this particular COP. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I would share your perspective on that. To me, uh, the net effect of the uh, energy crisis in Europe is to accelerate the transition. Uh, we, we, we're not getting more gas from Qatar than we had from Russia. We actually get less. Uh, and so the uh, energy crisis triggered the realization uh, that uh, there's a high volatility in gas and in other uh, fossil, and so it might be less reliable than uh, we thought, and so it triggered even more investments uh, in that. Um, uh, and so the, the uh, long-term, the, the, the medium and long-term uh, trajectory of the EU, the goal by 2030, and the uh, what we call the uh, fit for 55, which is the uh, long-term uh, goal of uh, decarbonation of the uh, uh, EU economy, are not changed. Uh, uh, so it, it's it, it's it's a bit of a, a hiccup on the road, or it, it's it's big hiccups. Uh, 
that 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 leads to a temporary relief. I mean, in Germany, they restarted coal uh, coal uh, plants. Uh, but in the long term, I'm not sure it will uh, it will change the trajectory, and I think it might even accelerate the uh, the uh, phasing out of uh, of uh, fossil. Uh, and that's that's a, a valid point over the long term. And I do want to completely acknowledge when we had that conversation with Tim Gould, the chief energy economist of the IEA, last time, we actually talked about is with everything that's happened, all the uncertainty in the markets, uh, all the the uh, instability coming out of the invasion, short term need to sort of, you know, create uh, bridges to, to keep lights on and keep uh, p- people warm. When we asked, is it a boost or setback for the global movement on decarbonization, he was unequivocal and clear as the IEA's world energy outlook that it is a boost over the long term. Uh, Even if that ultimate sort of peak and decline of fossil fuels in the future, and I know it depends on the fossil fuel, it seems it's it's uh, never-ending changing target. Now, I would love to hear from you a little bit about the Climate Overshoot Commission this new body that you've been involved in helping design and to stand up. Um, tell us about it. What is it all about? Uh, who's behind it? And maybe a little bit on its role at COP. Uh, so the uh, purpose of the commission is to, uh, the, the, the name of the commission is the, the uh, uh, Global Commission for Reducing Risks uh, from Climate Overshoot. Um, and it's not, uh, well, it, 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 it means what it means, that um, will be likely overshooting, and a warmer climate is a climate which is more risky. Um, uh, and uh, so the fundamental question is: Have we opened all the boxes? Uh, 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 not only mitigation that should remain the absolute first priority, um, but we know that mitigation, when we'll be reaching net zero, the only thing that will uh, have achieved is to stabilize the level of risk. Uh, where it is. Uh, it will not lower the temperature, and so it will not uh, uh, reduce the risk. Um, and so what are all the options that we have in the toolbox to uh, actively reduce the risks on people and on uh, uh, ecosystem? Um, and there are three possible big buckets. One is uh, adaptation, the second is a CDR, and the third is a solar geoengineering. Uh, and the purpose of this commission is to uh, uh, examine all these options, how they uh, interact with each other, um, uh, without displacing the mitigation, and to uh, recommend at the end of uh, this year a uh, recommendation on governance uh, of these, uh, these uh, tools to uh, be sure that we create the uh, less risky world for, uh, for, for people and for, uh, and for ecosystems. Uh, so it's, uh, it's composed by we, we, we wanted to compose this commission really by, uh, uh, with, the, with the people who know how to make big decisions and big trade-offs. Um, and so that the uh, realm of former heads of states and government, former heads of international organizations, uh, uh, ministers, uh, very high-level climate negotiators, and so on. Um, so the, the, the commission is, uh, uh, this is the composition of the commission. There are two-thirds of the members come from the Global South, which also necessarily leads to some kind of uh, discussion that are not necessarily what we uh, hear in many other um, uh, projects or dialogues or initiatives, but it was a necessary feature for this purpose since most of the risk at the end of the day will be uh, uh, suffered by the uh, uh, Global South country. Uh, uh, Who's behind it? I mean, uh, it's a commission that it's self-mandated. Uh, and it's important because that's a guarantee of its independence. Uh, most of them, uh, apart, apart th- th- there are a couple of them that are, uh, are still uh, um, still have uh, uh, responsibilities, but most of them are uh, uh, former policymaker, very high level policymaker, and so they are really free to uh, uh, speak freely, to uh, uh, examine uh, many options, to uh, have deliberation that they they wouldn't have if they were representing an institution. And, uh, and we really wanted to, this commission to be um, uh, totally uh, independent so that it could work uh, apart from the negotiation. So, of course, we, we, we very closely follow what's happening in all the negotiation process. But the goal is to open a space for 18 months of deliberation that at the end of the day would lead to uh, 
recommendation that would land back in the uh, in the uh, climate field, uh, but but not be constrained by the beginning, by where the uh, the, the, the negotiations are going, and by the uh, uh, positions of the different uh, states uh, representing uh, um, uh, people representing their their, their, their governments and, uh, and so on. I'd love to to get and uh, Adriana, you, David, Sarah, feel free to jump in. I I think an overshoot commission, I can see its necessity clearly. But when I put my NGO hat from my past back on, I would think, I'm worried. You scare me, and you scare me because I'm worried that you're conceding defeat. And this gets to the whole 1.5C or not, you know, should we hold maintain that target or not debate that was part of COP27, that coming in and even planning that we might overshoot the target and talking about adaptation and carbon removal and solar geo, that scares me. I worry it's going to be a distraction when we shouldn't let go of that 1.5 C target because any fraction of a degree of warming beyond that essentially just compounds misery in various parts of the globe. And you're coming in and you're essentially, you know, this is a part of so many other parts of climate debate. You're giving people, you're giving the polluters an out if we're creating that conversation when we should be holding their feet to the fire and saying 1.5 C or death. What, t- t- what, so, what's, so what's the, the response they, yeah, like when you show up? There are two things in, uh, in, uh, in what you were saying. One is, uh, should we plan for overshoots? Uh, good policy is to plan for every scenario, basically. Um, and that's where, uh, but, but, but you have to differentiate who is doing what and what are the links between the people who are doing what. So it's not the job for uh, any current uh, official process uh, to have the conversation we are having in this commission. Um, and uh, I, I, I would have thought that if the uh, COP declaration gave up on the 1.5, this would have been a failure. Uh, because they, 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 it's not their job to do that. Their job is to uh, uh, put pressure, to implement, to uh, advance new things and, uh, and so on. So you also need other, uh, uh, other bodies, other uh, people, other kind of dialogue that are separated from it, that are independent, and that plan for other possible scenarios. That's exactly why the Commission should be uh, uh, independent, high-level, self-mandated, and uh, uh, work apart from the, uh, uh, from the, from the current process. Uh, but since it's very likely, I think the, the IPCC says it's uh, almost unavoidable, that uh, there will be an overshoot, and we, we don't know the extent of the overshoot, but there might be an overshoot, then it's still good policy to review what, what, what could be done in that, uh, in that case. Your, your, your second point is uh, that gives a, a get-out-of-jail card uh, from uh, polluters. No, if the, if the process are well separated and are very clear on what they are, uh, what they are doing and what they are uh, uh, aiming to achieve, no, it, do- it doesn't. And the baseline of the work of the Commission is that mitigation should remain the priority. And nothing should displace mitigation. Uh, and this is the job of all the official process to, to, to work on that. And we fully support all, the, all, all this process. Um, but that shouldn't prevent to opening other boxes uh, and, 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 to, to, uh, uh, and to see what's inside. And I would go, uh, I would go a bit deeper uh, on this because it's, it's an important question. If we find ways and if the science is strong and if the governance is solved and there's a lot of ifs so a lot of reason not to uh, achieve this conclusion um, uh, to reach this conclusion but uh, if we think that there are tools that could uh, if they are uh, properly designed really help reduce the risks uh, from a warmer climate then it's almost a fault not to uh, examine them uh, uh, really deeply. Because why would you let, a, a, even without overshoot, I mean, what would you let the level of suffering uh, that happens at 1.5 uh, if you could have tools that could actively reduce the risks for all the society, for the people, or, 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 the, or the dramatic thing that you, that you just say? So the, there's kind of a moral imperative to, to look at that. But it has to be done, properly uh, uh, designed, clear on what its uh, goal is, independent, so precisely to avoid all the uh, risks you, you were mentioning. We, we simply have to walk and chew gum at the same time. To put it most bluntly, I think it would be immoral to say that the only policy instrument was cutting emissions. Because 
humans, humans now alive, are suffering harm now. And adaptive measures, at a minimum, can reduce those harms. And and it, it I I don't actually even believe that necessarily politically will reduce pressure to cut emissions because in fact when one starts to confront the harms really be uh, uh, quantitative about what the harms are be serious about what the liability is for those harms that ought to in many ways increase the pressure to cut emissions but whichever way that plays out politically it seems to me that in a world where we've created the CO two in the atmosphere that is causing harm it's an imperative to look at more things than only cutting emissions. We must cut emissions, but that is not the only thing to do. So uh, I guess I'll say that. I mean, on, on the 1.5, I mean, it, it is funny. You walk around the COP and people really believe that this target makes sense. Privately, everybody says that it won't be met. I think you've got to separate out the, a political tactic, which is that by trying to design something that tries to put a short-term force, you hope to get some action uh, uh, from the actual action you hope to get. I think probably a small fraction of people would really want us to cut emissions fast enough to get to 1.5, because doing that would require a level of economic dislocation with real harms to actual people that, that, are, that, are, that are big. The 1.5 strategy is a strategy to get political visibility, and I think it, it's been working. But you remember the goalposts have shifted a bit. The original kind of 1.5 was keeping temperatures below 1.5. As Andrea said, the 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 IPCC says that that's I forget what extremely unlikely or something. I mean, it, it's you know barring an asteroid impact, it's not going to happen. Uh, uh, and and I think most people in the game know that, but it's politically useful to keep this uh, uh, tail there. And I, I mean, I support that. I, I think the key things that is that a world with overshoot, a world with a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere is a world where there's an ethical imperative to pay off loss of damages. A world with overshoot is a world where there's some imperative to reduce long-term risk, which means carbon removal. We can debate how quickly and what methods, but but if, if there's a risk that's harming people, you want to reduce it, and cutting emissions doesn't reduce that risk. It just stops it getting worse, which we must do. And I think a world with overshoot is a world where there's an ethical case to understand how well solar geoengineering or things like that would work or not work and, and how we might govern them. That's that's my take on on how I think about it. Essentially, we need to think in the four dimensions, in emissions cuts, carbon removal, solar geoengineering, and, and adaptation. And the idea that we can solve this by only focusing on emissions cuts, I think, is gone because people are suffering harms now from CO2, which is in the air from the stock. I'll say so as someone who's, you know, less involved, obviously, um, very much so than than David and uh, Adrian in this, um, you know, I, I, I do think that the really real risk that was present maybe 10 or 15 or years ago, or even even more recently, that, you know, this would be a distraction from other efforts to cut emissions because it would be presented as a solution um, that we could just, you know, pursue instead. I think that risk is is significantly lower today because of all of the action that is uh, is happening on um, on reducing emissions. And I think, you know, the, the idea that people would say, well, we don't need to do emissions reductions because we'll just do this other thing um, is not uh, is not as big of a problem as it might have been previously. Um, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I will say in, you know, classic advocacy tactic of shifting the spectrum of the debate, going back to 1.5C versus, say, 2C, they, I remember, you know, starting my career talking about 2C and people have said, you're crazy, it can't be done, you know, we're going to overshoot 2C. And then I really credit Adrien, you and and your country people. Paris was the first time where I think we solidly reframed that. We shifted the spectrum of the debate down to 1.5 C. It's pretty clear we're not going to get there. We will overshoot it. But now 2 C seems much uh, much more achievable and keeping it below 2 C. So bottom line is we've had a whole hodgepodge of news to do with climate and a lot of bad news this year. But on this this case of boost or setback with all the news we've had, even if COP27 may have underwhelmed compared to COP26 in Glasgow, I think we've got a lot of progress. We're in a better place. We need to keep pushing. But when I look at my two decades of working on this issue, I actually feel better now than I've ever felt before in my career. One, one more word about at least my view of the commission is 
the, the existing structure, the, the UNFCC, these COPs, is so complicated, it's hard to talk about the big issues and their interconnections. And to me, the point of an independent panel like this, like other independent panels, uh, uh, you know, the Global Oceans Commission, et cetera, is that that people, uh, these people can talk and can be listened to. So we need to say who's on the panel. So it's got three ex heads of state, uh, Mohammed Isifu, uh, Philip Calderon, and Kim Campbell. Uh, it's got uh, Laurent Tubiana, the architect of, of COP, uh, Hina Carr, uh, Shui Lan, you know, people with really high level international profiles. And I think the key thing that it can do, what it will do is what the commissioners want to do, is it can talk in a more simple and blunt way about some of the interconnections of these elements of uh, climate policy that uh, we can't kind of effectively address in the kind of trench warfare and the kind of frozen in tiny little incremental changes that we're at in the COP process. And in that sense, I think it doesn't replace the COP process in any way, but it complements it. And that's why we need structures like this as well as the formal structure. Exactly my point. <laughs> All right. I think fitting words to end on. So, Adrien, thank you very much. Uh, we're really grateful for your time. And in five minutes, you can open the door and let your kids run in. Yes, exactly. <laughs> thank you very much. It was a, a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. So a reminder that this episode will be available at energyversusclimate.com and on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Please review and rate us on your favorite podcast platform as this helps new listeners find the show. You can also always send your feedback to info at energyversusclimate.com. A special thanks to all of our donors who helped us out uh, in our fall appeal campaign. Your contributions really help to keep us on the air. So thank you very much. And also, big thanks to Hannah Tai, Priya Kunikulato, Crystal Hickey, and of course, our producer, Eva Voynichescu, for all their support. See you next time.